Hi there viewers and welcome to the Repair It, Don't Wreck It channel. Today we're working on a Poolin Pro snow thrower, model number PR241. Before we get started, we're going to remove the safety key and disconnect the spark plug lead. I was so anxious to get started I forgot to film the problem. It was surging up and down, up and down, so I believe it's a fuel problem. This machine is a few years old and in good condition. I believe some fuel has sat around and plugged up some of the small openings in the carburetor. To get to the carburetor, you need to remove these two shrouds. They're all 10 millimeter bolts. Make sure you clean the area that you're working in before you get started. This way, if you drop anything on the floor, the chances are good you'll be able to find it. One thing I noticed with this machine, the 10 millimeter bolts are a little thin on the top. Here I'm using a 3 8 drive with the 10 millimeter socket. If I could do it again, I would probably use a quarter inch drive with a 10 millimeter socket, which would give me a little better control. You're gonna see throughout the video how I struggle the odd time with them. This is the first time I've taken this machine apart, so it's not all that difficult. You just have to pay attention to where all the bolts are and don't pull or yank on anything too hard. If it's not moving, there's usually a good reason why. What I would do after the season is to give the machine a thorough washing with soap and water before you put it away for the summer. You can get a lot of years of use out of these if you look after them. When removing this shroud, be careful. The primer tube and the wires for the switch are still engaged. You can see I removed the primer tube for better access. More 10 millimeter bolts. What I'm finding is the first one is easy, as you can see I'm taking off here, but the other one is in such a spot that I can't get the socket on straight. So I'm gonna have to get a 10 millimeter ratcheting wrench in there, one of the, my small ones. Now I need to block off the fuel supply. The clamp that I'm using is what I use when I'm doing the brakes on the car. It pinches off the flexible brake hoses. Once you get the clamp loose, you can slide it up the hose and then you can use a pair of pliers to rotate the hose back and forth to break it loose. Okay. 
Now we're ready to take the carburetor off. More 10 millimeter bolts. The screw that I'm removing sets the idle speed for the thrower. Since this hasn't been touched from the factory, I want to put it exactly in the same place it was. In this case, it's six and a half rotations. You need to remove this screw so you can get to the idle jet, which is the red piece just below it. The part that I'm working on here is the governor rod and there's also a spring which is very light duty so be careful with it. Both of those pieces attach to a rod with the holes and there's only a single hole for each so you can't go wrong. Now that all the bolts and linkages are off you can remove the carburetor. It looks in pretty good shape. There's a little bit of oil there, but I don't think that's a problem. Now that we've got the carburetor off, we can take it to the bench and disassemble it. Sorry about that. I forgot to turn off the compressor. Make sure you have a nice clean area. The parts are very small and you're gonna end up losing something if you're not careful. Everything here is 10 millimeter. Now you can take off the fuel bowl. When I look inside, it's reasonably clean, but there is a little bit of debris in the corner. Next, we're gonna remove the float. There's a small pin once you remove that pin, then you can carefully lift the float up. On that float, you're gonna see the needle valve. That you wanna to inspect to make sure that there isn't anything on the end of it and if there's any damage. Now I'm removing the emulsion tube. This is where the fuel comes up from the bowl through this tube and into the carburetor. You need a good sharp screwdriver as the nut that I'm removing is brass, which you'll see in a second. If you strip that, I'm not sure how you would get it out and probably have to buy a new carburetor. Now I'm gonna run a thin wire through the holes on the emulsion tube. What I like to use are the vinyl wraps to tie off garbage bags. If you strip the vinyl carefully and expose the wire, they are the perfect size. Now that I've run the wire through the holes, I'm gonna take some cleaner and flush it. Hopefully if anything came loose, this will get it out or dissolve it. I didn't show it in the video. You should also clean the needle valve that's on the plastic float. What I'm doing here is a basic cleaning. I'm not gonna thoroughly take it apart and soak it because I don't think it needs to be done. 
I'm going to try this first and see how it goes. Now that everything is clean, we can put it back together. That's the emulsion tube, which I'll put in first. Now that the emulsion tube is in, the next part is this plug, which holds it in place. Also, the bottom of this has an orifice in it. So when the fuel is being drawn up, it goes through this and then through the emulsion tube, then into the carburetor. Everywhere where fuel goes through the carburetor, the holes are quite small. So it doesn't really take too much to plug them up. Now that the emulsion tube is in, you can install the plug. The threads are very fine on this, so you need to be careful. I'm using a small screwdriver to get it started. Once you're happy that you haven't cross-threaded anything, you can use your larger screwdriver to tighten it up. Make sure that screwdriver is tightly into the plug and you don't strip the end of it out. Because if you do, if you ever need to take it apart, I don't think it'll be possible. Now install the plastic float with the float valve attached. Once it's in place, you can attach the float to the carburetor with the pin. Double check to make sure that the float moves freely up and down and there's no binding. The carburetor bowl is next. Make sure it is absolutely clean. There is a gasket on top of this bowl and it's in good condition so it didn't need to be replaced. Next, you can install the drain plug for the carburetor bowl. Don't forget the red gasket. This is 10 millimeter also. Double check the gasket on the fuel bowl. Make sure that it hasn't moved while it was being cleaned. If you notice, on the carburetor, there's two slots. The bowl fits in nicely and won't move. I believe they've done this to prevent it from getting twisted when you're tightening it up and causing a leak. Now you can attach the fuel bowl to the carburetor. Another 10 millimeter bolt. Don't forget the red gasket. You don't have to over tighten them, but they do need to be snug. Now you can tighten the bowl with a 10 millimeter socket. Now you can install the carburetor on the thrower. Double check the gasket to make sure that it hasn't moved and is in good condition. This one is, so I didn't replace it. Since I had a good view with the shroud and the camera set up, I decided to change the spark plug at this time. The gap on this one I had set at 0 .030, which is typically standard on most of these small engines. Whenever you're working on your machine, always consult the owner's manual for parts and specifications. It is the best way to avoid any problems. When installing the spark plug, thread it in as far as you can by hand. Here I'm using a 13 16 spark plug socket. What I like to do is tighten it until it starts to engage. There's a gasket on the end of the plug, so it's going to feel a little bit mushy. And then once the mush has gone out of it, then just give it an eighth of a turn. Now back to the carburetor. The first thing I'm going to do is put the idle mixture screw in. It has two O-rings on it. Make sure they are not damaged and this one was in good shape. And push it in all the way so it's firmly seated. Now you can install the idle set screw. If you remember, when we took it out, it was six and a half turns. Take your time because it is plastic going into a metal thread on the carburetor.
These nuts are 10 millimeter also. Thread them in by hand to make sure everything is pulling in nicely. Now you can attach the guard. It uses 10 millimeter bolts also. I'm trying to thread them in by hand because it's a little tricky getting in there and I don't want to cross thread anything. Once I got them started, I decided to use a 10 millimeter wrench instead of the socket. That bolt's a little tricky. There's another bolt in the way which you can't see that's partially blocking it. Before you install the shroud, don't forget to hook up the primer tube, which I haven't shown. What I like to do is put all the bolts on loosely, align them up and get them started. You'll find this will make life easier for you. Now that everything is tightened up, we can tackle some other maintenance items. Let's take the skid plate off and look at the friction plate and the gears to see what's going on. I'm going to remove the skid plate. There are four 10 millimeter bolts holding it on and there's two slots at the bottom. I'm going to put some grease on the ring gear and the pinion gear. You don't need a lot. Just put some dabs on and work it in with your fingers. The grease I'm using is called Super Lube. It's a multi-purpose synthetic grease. This stuff won't run, drip, or melt at minus 45 degrees Fahrenheit to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. This is perfect for this situation. I don't want any of this stuff dripping onto the friction plate. Now you can clean the friction plate, which is aluminum. I like to use lacquer thinner because it does a great job of removing the grease and evaporates fairly quickly once you're finished. Once I've cleaned half of the plate, I can change the gear to move the rubber disc to the left so I can clean the rest of it. That's how you get your speeds depending on the position of the rubber disc on the friction plate.
One last check to make sure there isn't any grease that's gonna fall onto that plate. Now you can put the skid plate back on, which is the reversal of the removal. There are four 10 millimeter bolts to install. These were a little rusty and tight when I was removing them, so I'm putting a little bit of grease on the threads to help get them back in and also keep them from getting rusted in too tight to remove later on. Next, I'm going to check the air pressure in the tires. You may not be able to see it, but it was zero PSI. I'm going to add 12 pounds pressure. You are allowed to put up to 22 pounds, but I think that's a little too hard. They should be a little bit softer for in the snow. This is the underside of the control panel. There's so many cables and connectors and rods, I decided just to spray the whole area down with silicone grease. The last thing I wanted to do today was to remove the wheels and grease the shafts. A fairly simple job, but important. If you don't do this over the years, these wheels could rust onto the shafts and almost be impossible to get off without destroying them. As you can see, the maximum inflation is 22 PSI. These tires are also directional, so if you take both of them off, pay attention when you put them back on. Now we're in the home stretch. The choke knob has an oval shape underneath, so it can only go on one way. Next, you can put the safety key in place and install the spark plug boot. Push it on firmly so it engages. If you can rotate it, and slightly tug on it without it coming loose, you've got it. Now that's running a lot better. It was worth the effort. If you like what you saw, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and as always, repair it. Don't wreck it. Thanks for watching.